So without further ado, uh, I'm Mike Harrison. We're going to talk about Status Athematicus. Uh, hopefully I live up to the anticipation that the last 20 minutes is probably generated. So we'll start with a, a definition of asthma. Um, that's actually the Greek word. I found all the, the fonts and it survived transition to two different computers and that's what it looks like when you write it in Greek. And that's the um, orogenesis of the word asthma. And it comes from panting or breathlessness if you uh, translate it into English. There are a number of different definitions um, that sort of encompass what the disease is, whether it's a hyperreactive, hyperresponsive airway, bronchospasm, uh, inflammation, hyperinflation, or reversible airway obstruction. You can find numerous ways of describing it in the textbooks. It seems to get at what, um, what it looks like when you look at it pathologically. And that's a, a slide, that's a post-mortem slide um, from somebody that died from an asthma attack. So you can see how thick the muscle um, is and how inflamed it is, and that's a thick mucus plug right in the, the middle of the airway. So that's what happens to somebody in an asthma attack. They end up with muscular hypertrophy. Um, in some cases, in severe cases, it can be up to 400% uh, compared to the, the norm. Um, hyperplasia, and then mucus secretion. Oh, here's the outline slide I was looking for. So what we're going to talk about um, is the definition of asthma, which we just did. Uh, we're going to go over more of the pathophysiology, the treatment options, uh, and one of the interesting things that I want to highlight that I found that I wasn't familiar with going through the literature was a role for ketamine. Uh, and so I'm going to focus on that just because I think it's something unique and unusual, and I know that Dr. Moore will get a big kick out of it. Uh, we're going to talk about status asthmaticus, uh, the definition, the epidemiology, treatment options, um, heroic efforts, and there are a few case studies that the heroic efforts can go all the way up to ECMO, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then pregnancy, because that's uh, a big concern there, because at that point you've got two patients, and one of them is entirely dependent on the health of another patient. Uh, and we can go through some of the same heroic efforts all the way up to ECMO and cesarean delivery. Uh, and just some of the unique things that go along with having a pregnant patient that's in status. So asthma is a very, very common disease. Uh, it's the most common chronic illness in pediatric population, and it's very common in adults as well. Um, the prevalence in Americans uh, as of 2008 was about 38 million. So roughly 10% of the, the population, uh, a little more than 10%, had asthma at some point um, in their life. Uh, and that, there's the breakdown of adults to children. Children tend to be more afflicted, females tend to be more afflicted than males, and then blacks tend to be more afflicted than uh, whites or Hispanics. And the annual prevalence, um, about 52% uh, of these folks will have an asthma attack. Uh, and the, this is a, a table that breaks it all down. This is all from Nowak and Tokarski, who are two of our ED physicians. They wrote the chapter in Rosen's, the ED textbook on asthma. Uh, so there's a bit of a, a Henry Ford connection that way. Um, in terms of medical events, uh, it's a very common reason for an ED visit for children, uh, as well as for hospitalizations. Um, and the more likely, or the people that are most likely to be hospitalized are adults over the age of 65 uh, as a result of an asthma attack. And the result is that it's about $21 billion worth of expenditures for the health care of those individuals, either coming through the emergency department, into the hospital, or into the ICU. In terms of morbidity and mortality, a significant number of school days and work days are lost as a result of asthma uh, in the adult and pediatric population, um, and it ranks within the top 10 of chronic conditions that limit activity uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. In terms of mortality, people do die of asthma attacks. Uh, the trend seems to be that we're getting better at preventing that. Um, but there are still a significant number of deaths in the United States uh, as a result of asthma. And our rates here are significantly lower than in the rest of the, the world. Um, women are more likely than men to die of asthma, and blacks are more likely than whites to, to die of asthma. Luckily, because um, one of the things that we all hate is when bad things happen to children, it's a, a rare event in the pediatric population. Things that increase your risk of uh, mortality in particular with an asthma attack tends to be, um, if you had to summarize it, underestimating the disease uh, and the acute attack. And that tends to be what gets people into trouble. So they don't know how sick they are, so they get undertreated. Or they come to the doctor, and the doctor doesn't necessarily recognize how sick they are or how sick they potentially can get, and they get undertreated. So they may leave the emergency department without steroids or, or something like that. Uh, they may rely heavily on either the prescribed inhalers or some over-the-counter medicines to try to treat things at home for as long as possible. And by the time they present to a, 
medical facility than they're actually bordering on or actually in extremis. Um, ambivalence towards past medical events, so big things that we ask in the emergency department is have you ever been intubated is one of the first questions we ask somebody that comes in that's short of breath because past behavior is an excellent predictor of future behavior and that's something that I want to know if we're going to have a very limited conversation. If you stop breathing or are unable to speak anymore, I want to know if you've ever had a tube placed before. Um, delay in initiating corticosteroid, and then over-reliance on Dr. ER to be your PCP. Uh, these people, if you're in and out of the emergency room on a regular basis, then it probably would be wise to so at least have a PCP, if not a, a pulmonologist following along. The pathophysiology, asthma can be broken down into two different categories, so it's either intrinsic or extrinsic. Uh, the intrinsic people are the people that you hear about having um, allergies, so it's an atopic asthma, it's IgE mediated, uh, and it's a response to an allergen. And the uh, non-atopic, the ex or intrinsic, um, I think I may have gotten the intrinsic and the extrinsic mixed up there, and yeah, I can see some faces that confirm that. Um, so switch these two. So the non-atopic is extrinsic. Uh, and these are the hyperactive, these are the exercise induced uh, asthma. People that um, either they go out in the cold or something like that, something triggers their asthma attack. Uh, a drug such as an aspirin or a beta blocker, an inhaled irritant, smoke being one of them. And what happens is you end up with a, right, some sort of stimulus that irritates the airway and you end up with an inflammatory cascade that then ends up with bronchoconstriction, muscular changes, hypertrophy, mucus secretion, and airway obstruction in one way, shape, or form. And that airway obstruction causes a problem uh, when you look at Pussell's law, where you look at um, what the resistance through the airway is going to be and how it changes as a result of that. So resistance is a function of the length of the tube, L, the gas viscosity, which is why things like heliox work, because you're going to change the viscosity of the gas and try to get more laminar flow. Um, and then the radius of the, the tube. So if you end up with bronchoconstriction, that actually has a very significant effect on what your resistance is going to be, because it's to an exponent, to a factor of four times pi, and that's your denominator. So if you make a small change, in the diameter of your airway, you end up with a very big change in your resistance. And as a result of that, you can end up with disrupted uh, flow, turbulent flow, and that also will increase your, your airway resistance. Classifications of asthma, uh, I'm sure we're all familiar with, and in the interest of time, we'll move on from here. Um, but we'll talk about ways to assess an asthma patient, either acutely or in the management of them within the hospital. Things change if you look at um, their blood gases in particular. And that, that's what this uh, table summarizes for you. That somebody that comes in in a, a mild attack may have a reasonably normal looking blood gas. Somebody that then is headed towards a mild or moderate or a more severe attack may end up actually alkalotic as a result of their tachypnea. And so what you end up with is you end up with a uh, high pH, right? You're in this range here with a low PCO2 because they are over hyperventilating at that point. And it's not until they run into real trouble, they either fatigue or the obstruction gets worse, that then you may end up with a normal gas, depending on when you draw that gas. And that's a transition towards a very ugly gas. So that's when you end up with the acidosis that we see, the low pH, the high PCO2, uh, and the discussion about whether or not somebody needs to be intubated or ventilated otherwise with BiPAP if their, their mental status will, will permit. So it's just something to keep in mind because um, I know we always ask for gas when we're holding the triage phone to figure out how sick the patient is and it's, there's potential that we may be led astray with that. Um, and then over here, I've just thrown that in there, that's from Marino's book. Uh, it's a, an algorithm for managing um, asthma in the acute phase to figure out who can go home and who needs to come into the ICU. The treatment of asthma I'm sure we're all familiar with, and we're going to talk about ketamine because it was one that I wasn't familiar with, and I think it's, it's interesting just as a, an adjunct to be aware of because I wasn't aware of all the different uh, pharmacological ways that ketamine works in asthma. But your, brain, your main um, approach is it's either going to be a bronchodilator, an anti-inflammatory, or an adjunct. So your bronchodilators are trying to address that airway resistance, try to increase the, the diameter uh, and increase the size of your denominator in Pussell's law. So you've got your beta agonists, your anticholinergics, uh, epitributylene, which is used quite a bit in the, the pediatric population, uh, and your mag sulfate, that's a smooth muscle relaxant. And the anti-inflammatories, corticosteroids, 
caffeine, um, and that one came up a lot actually in pregnancy. Believe it or not, theophylline is safe uh, in pregnant patients. Leukotriene inhibitors, which um, seem to be some were and some weren't safe. Uh, mast cell stabilizers, anti-IgE for the folks that have got uh, an atopic form of their asthma, and then your adjuncts, your helium, your heliox to try to decrease uh, turbulent flow and increase your laminar flow, and then your anesthetics such as ketamine and isofluorine because you can paralyze some of these people as well um, and sedate them and see if that, that helps with the vent. But what you need to do um, is somehow dilate that, that bronchial. So ketamine came up, and this was a the best paper I found on it, it took 20 reports. Um, I think 12 of them were observational studies. There was, a, I think, one or two that were randomized trials, and then the rest were case series and case reports. Uh, that's added up to 240 patients um, through a wide range of years to have a look at how effective ketamine is in managing status asthmaticus. Uh, and the general outcome seemed to be that there was an improved outcome with the acute use of, of ketamine which I thought was interesting because it's not something I've ever used for this uh, and I didn't understand fully how it worked. They had a wide range of uh, measurements to figure out if the ketamine was effective or not, um, very similar to what we're using. Vitals, ABG results, uh, lower O2 requirements, less need for invasive uh, ventilation. Um, and in 86% of patients in one study, it showed significant benefit that way. And then with no major adverse event, which may not necessarily translate to our population where there's probably a large group with some underlying psychiatric illness that you're potentially going to unmask by giving them ketamine. Um, but patients in, in their various populations tended to tolerate it very well. So ketamine, uh, and that's the, the chemical name when it was first derived, and that's the, the chemical structure for ketamine, um, has got a, a wide range of ways that we can give it that I didn't know about. I knew about the IV and the IM. I didn't know that you could nebulize it, give it as a racemic uh, treatment. You could do a PO, an intranasal, or a PR dose, uh, and the bioavailability on all of those is nearly identical, uh, very high one way or the other. So it seems to be any way you can get ketamine into your patient, uh, it's going to have a, a reliable dose. Um, the pharmacokinetics has got a quick onset. It lasts for a, a few minutes um, and will give you time to, to do what it is that you want to do. So in terms of its mechanism of action, uh, it's got bronchodilatory, dilatory, it dilates the bronchioles. We'll use that word instead. Um, and it does it through a number of different ways. Uh, it downregulates the nitric oxide pathway. Uh, it blocks um, receptors reverses histamine-induced bronchoconstriction. So it's got a, a number of ways that it acts that way to get you your bronco um, dilatation effects. It also inhibits your vagal uh, tone, which is then going to help with um, smooth muscle relaxation and dilatation. It blocks calcium channels, which is going to do the same thing. Uh, and then it may have um, some effect on increased ventilation. There was some conflicting results that way. A couple of papers said that it improved ventilation, and a couple of papers said that it decreased ventilation, but the rest of the effects seemed to offset that um, adverse event. And then others seem to say that it would just maintain ventilation at whatever rate the patient wanted. Uh, and then it's got dissociative properties that help um, potentially avoid intubation because your patient's a little calmer uh, if they're dissociated from the event. They're not a, as panicky as they are and potentially fighting and bucking against whatever intervention it is that you're trying to do. The dose, um, fairly standard. Uh, we use one mg per kg IV. It's one to five or four to five uh, for IM. And then you can set them on a, a continuous infusion as well. So I wouldn't necessarily make this my first line treatment in asthma. Um, like I said, I'm highlighting this because it was something I wasn't aware of, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, uh, possibly with the exception of Dr. Moore, who is a big fan of the Special K uh, for a variety of indications. Uh, but it does show some promising results going through these, uh, these case studies. It's versatile, it's inexpensive, and like I said, basically any way you can get it into your patient, uh, it'll, it'll work. But there is some further work to be done. So moving on to, to status asthmaticus, um, this was the original paper that I could find that, that talked about this uh, from 1950. Um, it talks about it being described in, in 1933 initially, uh, and this was just a, an interesting paper to read because it would present the evidence and then an opinion for every paragraph, right? Research says this, however, in my practice I feel that this does or does not work. Uh, so it was very interesting to read how papers were written back in, in 1950. 
Um, it is a life-threatening condition characterized by progressive respiratory failure uh, that is unresponsive to standard therapeutic measures. And this can be acute and both subacute. Some cases, some patients present uh, within minutes to hours of an onset of an attack. Some patients fight it for a few days at home and will come in after a couple of days. Uh, mortality has got a, a wide range even when somebody gets to the ICU. And the challenges are um, either severe bronchoconstriction, so the people that present very acutely that this has started within the last few minutes uh, are the ones that tend to have severe bronchoconstriction. The ones that have been fighting their asthma attack for the last couple of days at home tend to present in the status asthmaticus as a result of mucus plugging, uh, as a result of cumulative secretions, uh, and then air trapping. And one paper said that the optimal treatment strategies have not yet been fully delineated. This disgusting looking specimen on the side here is an actual mucus plug uh, that came out of a, a status asthmaticus patient uh, as a result of a, a bronch. This paper um, actually sort of straddled a, an interesting um, time frame uh, between I guess pre-permissive um, hypercapnia and low tidal volumes, lung protective strategies, and post-lung protective strategies in managing the vent. And they took uh, the patients that they had in that 30-year period and had a look at what happened to their patients in the, in the ICU. Um, and so it's a single center trial, uh, and they, they summarized everything nicely. We're not going to spend, this is not that interesting. The interesting part is looking at the pre and post lung protective strategy uh, approach to, to managing the vent. So in the pre lung protective strategies, the, that was the average tidal volume uh, that they were using for their status asthmaticus patients, uh, 725 cc's. Uh, and I didn't see anything that they were treating, nothing but NBA and NFL players. These were reasonably average sized human beings that they were ventilating up to a liter. Um, per breath, uh, which seems excessive. Uh, and oddly enough, when they switched, and we'll show you, it's not that slide, it's this slide. So in the first 20 years, they had seven pneumothoraxes, and then in the last 10 years, after introducing the lung protective strategies, the pneumothorax issue seemed to, to go away. Um, they had to paralyze these patients uh, a little less than they did here, so we got, got better at using that. Um, as a, a lung protective strategy, uh, and we were more permissive of our, our hypercapnia. Um, and again, this is just the who we were, were dealing with, there, so there were no differences really in characteristics at that point. But there were differences in uh, the pneumothorax that we pointed out, and then a couple of other things um, along the way. The death was actually a result of, I think it was a GI, yeah, massive GI bleed after anticoagulation um, after getting a, an MI. So it wasn't necessarily the attention pneumo killed them, but it was a, an adverse event. They had um, a number of myocardial infarctions, but I thought the, the pneumothorax was the, the most interesting of the, the complications out of that. Which brings us to the mechanical ventilation, and the reason it's significant is about 50% of our asthma patients that make it to the ICU are likely going to be intubated uh, at some point in their stay. And the clinical indications um, based off of a consensus paper are highlighted there. So clinical suspicion or indication to intubate somebody is high up on the list. Number two is cardiac arrest, which can be a subtle event, uh, and we may, may miss it. That's an indication for ventilation. Silent chest, progressive exhaustion, altered sensorium. Um, and then the strategies to avoid dynamic hyperinflation. A dynamic hyperinflation is when the next breath starts before you fully exhaled uh, and ventilated from the, the first breath. And that would be Something that was probably a big problem in that first 20 years where they were taking tidal volumes of 1,000 cc's, um, and that's why we're using things like a, a lung protective strategy now. Uh, you can use those low tidal volumes, maximize the time for expiration, and then if possible consider non-invasive ventilation. Because what you want to do is you want to move where you are on, on this curve in terms of um, resistance and, and volume, pressure and volume, from the steep part of the curve down here to the, or from the shallow part up high down to the steep part here. One study, uh, or one case study, um, highlighted the importance of ECMO as a heroic rescue strategy in somebody who all else has failed uh, for ECMO. And this is the timeline that they've got for this particular patient in their, their paper. Um, and ECMO was started, let me find it here. So ECLS is ECMO. Um, extracorporeal life support is what they were calling it in this particular paper. Uh, and so you can see the, the gases that they were attempting to fix. Um, they made it to a PEEP of 28, 
Uh, basically everything failed. They tried paralyzing the patient. The gas was continuing to get worse. Um, dynamic hyperinflation despite paralysis. Uh, and then ECMO was started. Um, and after ECMO was started, uh, it took a couple of days of ECMO. Um, and within 10 days, they had the patient extubated with no neurologic uh, sequelae and, and did just fine. So it is something that if you end up at the point that you can't, can't break uh, whatever it is that's causing um, the status, you do have a, a fallback to continue. So we'll now move into the, the battle of the sexes portion of the, the conversation. Um, because women are, are more likely to be afflicted uh, from asthma. So the thought was that women are more likely to require critical care um, for status asthmaticus and are at greater risk of having um, this particular condition despite uh, extreme therapies. And so this paper pulled uh, MICU admissions at Yale between 94 and, and 2000 and had a look at, at what the different characteristics were. Um, and so they had 24 women who accounted for 37 uh, ICU admissions during that time period, 13 men that accounted for 16 admissions. So keeping with the stats, more women than men uh, suffered from it. However, the men seemed to be more likely to have um, worse outcomes in terms of requiring intubation. Uh, and reading between the lines in the, the paper, they basically sum that up to how stubborn men are. Uh, that women, when they're not feeling well, have enough sense to go see a doctor and get treated properly. Um, and men will carry their body parts into the hospital and say it's just a scratch and they're doing fine. Uh, and so I said by the time the men presented, they were significantly sicker than the, the women were. Uh, and the only options they really had in some cases were to, to tube these people. They weren't going to be responsive to, to regular therapy. So mixing things up a little bit in the battle of the sexes, we'll move on to the, the next phase and we'll discuss pregnancy. Um, and this was a fantastic movie. I happen to own it. VHS, DVD, Blu-ray. So, no, I paid full price. I want to support, excellent. Support the arts, right? Um, so things change uh, when you get pregnant. Um, and so I actually mess with my in-laws. Uh, and so I refer to pregnancy as a sexually transmitted parasitic infection. And that was how I announced to them that they were going to be grandparents. And then I let them figure it out for an hour. It was a lot of fun. Um, but but that's, that's what it is. And so as a result, you get some physiologic changes. Um, the thoracic circumference uh, on a pregnant woman will change. It will actually increase, but the diaphragm gets um, deviated northwards as a result of the, the enlarging uterus and the, the fetus. Uh, you end up with an increased um, blood volume, uh, both total body water and plasma, an increase in your red blood cell mass, but a, a hemodilution as a result. So the patients are going to appear to be anemic on their gas. Cardiac output goes up. Um, AVO2 difference goes up. You end up actually with um, more smooth muscle relaxation as a result of both the progesterone, which is also a respiratory stimulant, and as a result of the relaxant. So actually the effect on a normal pregnancy, um, right, because you have that uh, progesterone relaxant effect is that you end up with no change in resistance in terms of the, the airways, assuming everything is going well. Um, but there are some other differences in terms of airway edema, uh, airway collapse that put, put women at risk. You end up actually with an increase in tidal volume as a result of that circumferential change in the, the thorax, uh, an increase in the, the minute volume and then an increase in some other potent bronchoconstrictors. But if everything goes well, um, you do tend to, to break even. However, there is a, a large proportion, there are people that uh, have asthma, I think I've got a slide, yeah, um, that have asthma are more likely to have uh, a severe attack during pregnancy, and it is something to be aware of. And it's a, a diagnosis that arises de novo um, in the, the pregnant population. The risk is um, manageable if you do adhere to, to pregnancy or to your medications um, and see, see a doctor and manage this accordingly. Uh, but the case studies that I've got that we're going to go through quickly, uh, in all, all cases, it was medication non-adherence and it was a frequent flyer that tended to get into a, a lot of trouble. Um, the adverse events that are associated with asthma and pregnancy basically come from the, the theme that mom's not only eating for two, but breathing for two. So if mom's hypoxic, you don't need labs. You can just assume that the, the fetus is going to be hypoxic as well. And if mom's in distress, then the fetus is definitely in distress. Uh, and so the, the risks that go along with that, preterm delivery, uh, perinatal mortality, low birth weight, preeclampsia, um, uncontrolled asthma in pregnancy is a, a bad thing. 
and we, we went over that, so I'll move along in the interest of time. The impact of a uh, pregnant asthma attack, um, and this was uh, an interesting study, they actually intentionally induced hypoxia in late-term pregnant patients uh, for a 15-minute period. Um, it hasn't been replicated, believe it or not, uh, but what they found um, is that right when mom's PO2 drops as a result of breathing an FiO2 of 15%, the fetal PO2 drops significantly as well. Um, all the patients in this particular study, uh, there were no complications with birth, and as far as we know, the children are doing just fine. But it was not a paper I was expecting to find because I didn't think that anybody would actually do this uh, with a, a patient. Maternal um, alkalosis is a result of the, the hyperventilation, so it's a respiratory alkalosis that you're going to find if you get a, a blood gas on a, a normal pregnant patient, and that's completely okay. Um, and, but as they get more, it, as their asthma attack progresses, they may augment that alkalosis, and the result is that you're going to get a decrease in uterine blood flow, which is what the fetus is dependent on for all its nutrition, and uh, oxygenation, and ventilation, a decrease venous return. So you're not going to be moving some of that blood necessarily away from the, the uterus. Um, less blood flow and then a, a shift in the, the hemoglobin curves. And so this here, this green line, um, is the oxyhemoglobin oxy association curve for hemoglobin A, uh, normal blood for you and I. And then this blue line is an F. Um, so fetal hemoglobin has a, a higher affinity for, for oxygen, just at baseline. Uh, and it's not going to behave the same way. So any shift uh, is also going to affect that. Um, therapy in pregnancy, uh, all the conventional stuff is here that we've gone over, so albuterol, corticosteroids, magnesium, theophylline, all tend to be um, safe in pregnant patients. Then you've also got your intubation, uh, and then any asthma patient that shows up that is pregnant probably warrants fetal monitoring. Terbutaline um, is a, a concerning treatment in pregnancy is good in the pediatric, it's good in the rest of the population, but it's got tocolytic effects, so it may actually induce labor uh, in a, a pregnant um, patient if you start treating them with uh, terbutaline, and then it's going to drop their diastolic blood pressure. Uh, epinephrine is going to cause vasoconstriction, which is also going to decrease blood flow to the, the uterus and the fetus, uh, so you would like to avoid that. And then intubation. And the biggest uh, risks that seem to pop up in the papers for that is that there's an increased risk of aspiration due to when you lay the patient flat and you've got a large uterus that's pressing up against the stomach and you're doing this in an emergent situation, uh, stomach contents may head north as the, the path of least resistance. And then you may end up encountering a significant amount of laryngeal uh, edema, which may make the intubation a difficult maneuver um, just at baseline. And then some of the heroic efforts, and we'll talk about a case study here, uh, cesarean section and ECMO. Um, so mechanical ventilation in pregnancy, very similar. Uh, there aren't a whole lot in terms of, of changes um, that you need to do in terms of managing the vent. Uh, the indications are the same, fatigue, uh, hypoxia, uh, cardiac arrest, obviously. Um, and then consider that uh, a normal, right, the respiratory alkalosis that we talked about, narrow airways, which is going to have an impact on your resistance. Uh, and then a decreased oxygen reserve, because one of those slides back there showed that the metabolic rate of a pregnant patient is significantly elevated. So if you've got an elevated metabolism, your oxygen requirements go up, so their reserve is lower. So these people definitely need to be pre-oxygenated prior to intubation. Um, and then you're going to have to manage the, the ventilator accordingly, right? Because these people are, are tachypnic at, at baseline. So ventilated, no uh, randomized trials, obviously, and vent management with um, pregnancy, uh, high risk of barotrauma, um, hypercapnia we, we talked about is a, a risk because if you make mom hypercapnic and metabolically uh, or respiratory acidotic is the word I'd be using there, um, then you're going to have some problems because the fetal ventilation is dependent on a gradient. So the fetus is not going to offload CO2 if mom's got a high CO2 because it's got to have a gradient that it can flow down and offload that uh, and optimize fetal health. And that's why if you end up with an acidotic uh, pregnant patient that's intubated because of asthma, then you should be considering a bicarbonate drip to, to treat these patients. Um, and then respond to fetal uh, distress, and that's why they should be on a, a monitor in some way, shape, or form. Um, you can decrease the PEEP to try to augment your cardiac output, which is going to improve blood supply to the fetus. Um, you can use FiO2 rather than a PEEP, so sort of going against the ARDS net 
tables, uh, you'll use more FiO2 to decrease the PEEP, to increase your venous return and your cardiac output, um, and then you'll adjust the, the tidal volume uh, accordingly. So this was a, a case study of a, I think she was a 28-year-old um, woman, multiple pregnancies, this was pregnancy five or, or six, uh, who came in in distress at, at 33 weeks. Uh, this was hospitalization either four or five, I can't exactly remember, uh, during this hospitalization for asthma. Um, and at this point, uh, they were attributing it all to medicinal noncompliance. Um, this was her pre-intubation gas, so significantly acidotic uh, as a result of CO2 retention. Uh, and then they just basically had difficulty um, improving that, right? Even after intubation on high FiO2 and a PEEP of 8 um, with peak pressures that were in the 40s, uh, they weren't making a whole lot of headway. Uh, and she eventually went into shock requiring vasopressors. So she had an emergent C-section at 33 weeks. Um, small baby, low APGAR scores, and it gives you an idea, right, of how dependent the baby is on on mom for um, acidosis or for acid base management. Uh, the pH in the baby was nearly identical. Um, and then nearly immediately post delivery uh, from the C-section, her mechanics on the vent changed significantly. The peak pressure dropped from 45 down to 28. Tidal volumes went from 200 up to almost 500. Uh, and the FiO2 they were able to wean fairly significantly within a matter of minutes of uh, the baby being delivered. And then ECMO. Um, there aren't case studies necessarily for uh, status asthmaticus in pregnant patients, but the, during one of the H1N1 um, outbreaks in Australia and New Zealand, they had a large number, um, and by large I mean probably about a handful uh, of pregnant patients that ended up on ECMO um, because they were having very difficult times in, in oxygenating them with reasonably good numbers, uh, maternal survival of 80%. Um, fetal survival of 70%, and then some special considerations uh, because a, a number of them had complications is that you will probably need a lower level of anticoagulation, especially if you're heading towards a delivery or a C-section at some point. You don't want them fully anticoagulated. Uh, and then to be aware of maternal positioning. So while you've got this person um, laying in a hospital bed, remember to uh, position them so that you offload the IVC. Uh, so some final takeaways. Um, Marino summarized it well in his ICU book. Uh, basically, keep it simple. Uh, people are going to get an anti-inflammatory in the form of a corticosteroid and a bronchodilator. Um, everybody that comes in in asthma. And then remember that you've got a, a number of backups and adjuncts uh, that you can use if they're not responding to conventional therapy. And then this is from that original paper um, that disappointed me immensely. Alcohol has no role in the treatment of status asthmaticus. I'm sorry. Any questions? How'd I do for time? I made it up. Sir? Can you go back to your slide on Messiah's law? Sure. Yes. Oh, there it is. So the equation that you presented is correct, but the resistance, that equation for resistance is in the presence of laminar flow. Okay. And the equation that you've written depends on gas viscosity. In air, the most common gas is nitrogen, mm -hmm. and the viscosity of nitrogen and the viscosity of helium Very are virtually the same. Oh. The, the reason that helium is used is not because of this equation. The reason it's used is because turbulent flow causes a lot of problems with resistance. The resistance in turbulent flow becomes nonlinear and it becomes very complex and it's very high. Okay. And so what you want to do in um, somebody who has asthma is prevent turbulent flow. You want to promote laminar flow. Mm -hmm. And the number, the, the, the index, index or indicator which determines when that happens, when turbulent, when laminar flow changes to turbulent flow, is based on something called the Reynolds number. Okay. And the Reynolds number is calculated using density. And so by, so helium is not different from nitrogen in terms of viscosity, but it is very different in terms of density. And so what 
use of helium does is changes the Re Reynolds number and it promotes laminar flow. And so that's why you want to use it. So it's a complex thing, um, and it's cool that you represented that, but that's the reason okay. that helium works um, because it promotes laminar flow. Okay. Okay. So yeah, one thing in kind of one of the slides you had stated that they use smaller tubes. But basically, when an endotracheal tube, you know, oh. Dr. Lutz talking about uh. through the endotracheal tube, you have laminar flow. If you use that equation with an endotracheal tube of seven versus nine, you've literally halved your resistance. Yeah, yep. the, the reason oh, that kind of troubled me about that one slide. Well, and I can explain. Zach is that people, with, when women are pregnant, they have big upper airway problems. Yeah. And you have to use small tubes. Yeah, and that's that's, that's why I said really smaller issue. tubes because yeah. the airway edema, you're only going to be able to get. That's exactly right. Yeah, sorry, I should have clarified that. Thank you. Thank you.